So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. My apologies for the brief delay, but we can't talk about Nord Stream without Naftogaz. I want to welcome my uh, two uh, speakers, uh, Andriy uh, Kobolyev, who is CEO of uh, Naftogaz, and Olena Zerkal, who is Deputy Minister for Foreign Affairs. I propose, uh, we've got about 20 minutes for this uh, section, so we're going to get quickly into the uh, into the uh, views of the panelists, and if I have time, I'll try to take one or two observations from the audience. Andre, I'd like to start with you, if I could. Uh, we know all the controversy that's about this, the different interests that are there. Can you spell out for us, as CEO of Naftogaz, what is, what is your key anxiety about this, and over what kind of time perspective? How immediately do the kinds of anxieties you may have click from being theoretical to real in the scenarios you're looking at. Hello? Oh, yes. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak here. And uh, I believe that all people in this room are pretty much aware of Nord Stream 2 as a project, uh, about controversies, as you said, surrounding this project, and how much that can influence Ukraine. Uh, from Ukrainian side, we have been permanently discussing this with numerous international counterparties, uh, with many people whom we consider friends of Ukraine, and we are very grateful for their support and for their understanding, and we are very grateful for the fact that this issue at least is being discussed at such a high level by so many influential politicians all around the world. And from our perspective, Nord Stream 2 is a much wider problem than just gas matters. Uh, that's about security of Ukraine, and I believe I will not exaggerate if I say that for us it's a matter of our survival. If gas transit leaves our country, we are very confident that this will open way for a full-scale military aggression from Russia, from Russia towards Ukraine. And that's what exactly we are trying to avoid. It's not only about money, it's not about revenues either of NAFTA gas or of the state of Ukraine uh, that owns the pipeline itself. It's also about our security. And by saying our security, I believe it is also obvious that it is also about security of the whole European Union. Currently, between Russia and European Union, there is Ukraine. We are fighting our war for independence. Uh, we are trying to protect ourselves, but we're also protecting European Union. If we cease to exist as an element of protection, that will be not beneficial for anyone. Thank you for answering with the security answer. I want to come back to the economic question and just talk me through what those perspectives look like. Uh, you, you, you say you will lose the transit. Talk some numbers, give me some sense of scale, and give me some sense of timeline. Uh, sense of scale is, again, quite obvious. It's three billion US dollars per year. That's currently the revenue uh, we are receiving for transit of Russian gas through the territory of Ukraine. Uh, if Nord Stream 2 would be, its construction would be launched somewhere around today, uh, I believe that within two years the project may be completed. Uh, and as soon as project is completed, uh, all calculations uh, show that there will be no transit through Ukrainian territory. Uh, some of the gas will be moved to the Turkish Stream. The remaining part will be moved to Nord Stream 2. And I am um, always um, smiling when people are trying to bring the argument that Ukraine would be competing with Nord Stream 2 through tariffs, through different conditions, or whatever, and that uh, it's not a kind of lost battle. No, it's a lost battle. If we look at Nord Stream 1, is a good example of something which already exists. At the time when the project was built, Ukraine had the lowest transit rate through all European countries. Still, the project was created, and all volumes of gas which were sent through Nord Stream 1 were deducted from our system. So for us, effect will be very quick, and I would say detrimental. For, again, number-wise, 3 billion US dollars, approximately 3% of our GDP. That's a big number. Okay. Thank you very much for that. Um, Olena, I want to take the case we've just heard and wonder how are you projecting it? Where are you delivering your message? 
and what progress, if any, do you think you're making in convincing people, not just of the validity of your case, but to change their minds? Oh, thank you for such a considerable question. But the matter of fact is that the topic of Nord Stream 2 became highly discussion and highly raised on different forums for four years. But now it's a matter not only for Ukrainian security, but also I want to echo Andre and say that it's also about European security. And it also can be considered as a threat to Europe as such, as a project. Because firstly, we have an experience in Azov Sea, and we know how Russia can increase its military presence because of construction and functioning of the Kerch Bridge. And the same situation might happen with Baltic states and with Baltic Sea as a consequence of construction of Nord Stream 2. This is the first topic. And the second topic about the unity, about the unity and readiness of European Union to pursue the same policy, the same policy concerning companies which actually are using by the Russian government as a tool and as a tool which pursuing Russian policy which can be easily accommodated as a weapon and used as a weapon against any state in Europe. And this for us is a crucial issue. And I don't think this is only a crucial issue for Ukraine, but also for the European Union as such. So again, to, to stick with the issue, if I'm, if I'm listening to Mrs. Merkel's statements, if I read what she tells yesterday in Vilnius, it seems to me like the green light for GO is pressed in this project, that the construction is already commencing, that the planning permissions to pass through the territorial waters, Russia, Finland, Sweden, Denmark, Germany, are all in place. This is an awful lot of ducks lined up in a row suggesting that they're going to move. And the money, the finance to build it is in place. Uh, coming back to the nearest past, we all remember the case of South Stream and what happened with the South Stream when European legislation was applied to this construction of the South Stream. Russia just refused for, from this construction. We actually expect that they can refuse from the Nord Stream 2 because it's only economically viable if European legislation is not applied on it. Okay, but uh, it, it, I mean, whatever view I have is of, of no material difference, but it seems to be the view of the Chancellor of Germany can't be ignored. And I haven't heard her offer a view. She does express concern about Ukraine. She does say she wants the Russians to deal with transit through Ukraine, and she does say it in the context of insisting that Nord Stream 2 still makes economic sense and that it's an economic project. And these are her words, not my words. Andre. Um, I would like to make a small comment on what you said. From what I understand, uh, the permission to go through uh, exclusive economic zone of Denmark has not been granted yet. Uh, and the option which is currently being considered by consortium is to circumvent uh, the zone by going through a different route. That seems like an easy solution. However, the route uh, has a lot of complexity and potential risk. And the major risks come from the fact that during the Second World War, a lot of munition was dumped there, also chemical munition. And dealing with chemical munition uh, in the North Sea uh, is very complex and potentially dangerous thing. So that issue has not been resolved yet. Uh, speaking of Germany and speaking of German position, um, it has been always a big surprise to me because if you look at position uh, of German government, uh, they have been permanently insisting that third energy package should not be applied to Nord Stream 2. That is formal position, which we heard a lot in different cabinets in European Parliament, for example. And this, I believe, contradicts genuine German and European interest. Because let's assume Nord Stream 2 can make economic sense. Let's forget about Ooh. Ukraine for a second. Let's look at pure interest of German and other European companies. 
if third energy package is not applied to this pipeline, that means Gazprom will be a monopoly user of the pipeline, the way it's using Nord Stream 1, mm -hmm. which means that companies, German companies, French companies, British companies, which are currently producing gas in Russia, will not be able to export that gas into Europe, which makes their business significantly less attractive and less lucrative than if they, were chance, if they were given a chance to sell gas to European Union. So if you look at German position, I would expect that it would be much more feasible and pragmatic to say, okay, we need this pipeline, but we want third energy package to be applied to this. So you want unbundling, in other words? Uh, well, it can be, it's not exactly unbundling, it's rather unlocking monopoly expert position of Gazprom from Russia to European Union. That position would be much more understandable from my point of view, because that position takes into account European interest. It's not only in the interest of Gazprom, but also takes into account interest European companies, and that makes perfect sense. On the contrary, German politicians say, no, 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 third energy package is not applicable here. I know why. Because if they say it should be applied, then Mr. Putin will be very unhappy. They don't want to make Russians unhappy. They are afraid of Russians. And that's, I believe, one of the major drivers behind these projects. Russians have been seen in many parts of Europe as a very uh, efficient player who is using malign influence to uh, affect political processes. We've seen that uh, in UK. We now see this in Germany. And I believe this fear of Russia is something, it's a bluff which should be also called. So let me offer another perspective, because it's interesting. Olena, to, to take that argument and flick the coin a bit, the EU is a huge importer of gas. About 69% of all uh, gas uh, energy used in the EU is imported. And of that 69%, if we take that universe, 37% comes from Russia, 33% I think it is from uh, Norway, and the third one is 11% from Algeria, which is also Russian because the Algerian contract, I think, is Gazprom owned or influenced. And through all of the flack that we see, the arguments about Crimea, Donbass, sanctions, the gas business has been business as usual. The weaponization fear you speak of isn't the lived reality. The gas business to do with the, the European supply chain has been a very reliable strategic delivery. The, the gas process, as we look at it, did suffer a downturn, but that was because of economics and macroeconomics. But as soon as the economy picked up, the business as usual gas thing picked up. So maybe, apart from fear, maybe people's experience is, this is a reliable strategic partner, it's working for us, and we're doing business on this issue. Maybe your fears of the weaponization and your lived experience are not the ones that people on the other end of the supply chain in other EU states uh, actually have lived with. You see, this is a question of reliability. How can you talk about the Russia as a reliable partner when it does not respect any rules, any rulings of any international courts, any rulings of international arbitration, which can break all words and actually all deals. Now we have few scenarios which are suggested uh, on the public. First, this is a German scenario. Actually to have a deal and to offer Ukraine some amount of gas, which will be contracted by any partner in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. But how to make the deal with a country which actually does not respect Budapest Memorandum? And how to believe in these deals? Who can guarantee this deal? And how to guarantee this deal? This is the first scenario. The second scenario is the scenario which we promote. We promote the actually equal treatment for all kind of pipelines and all kind of Russian gas supplies line to Europe. And this is about the third energy package. Mm. We are actually ready to apply fully all rules in Ukraine, but we want all rules to be applicable in the Baltic Sea as well. And the second scenario, but this is actually like a last uh, scenario, this is a sanction scenario. And I'm not sure that everybody are in favor of this scenario. That may be, but I'm not sure whether Mr. Trump will decide European energy policy either if we're making that uh, point. 
I'm very tight on time. I'm sorry we started a bit late and I have a hard stop in about four or five minutes. I'd like to turn quickly to the audience for short comments or questions if anyone has them. Yes, please, Michael, Michael uh, Gawler down here. Can you keep your hand up, please, uh, Michael, Member of European Parliament. Yes, please, Michael. Yes, thank you very much. Well, I'm, I'm one of those German politicians who, like Elmar Brock, like Norbert Röttgen, who would have been here today, like uh, Manfred Weber, who might be a candidate for commission president, have spoken out publicly against this project. Now, on the other side, I do not think you had the notion that Germany is afraid of Russia. I don't think that. Definitely not. It was said it is a private project. I mean, we all know it is a political project. But I think what we should concentrate on now is that this uh, third energy package that was voted is this famous Buzek report in the European Parliament. We voted that, and it is up for trilogue, that we see to it that in the discussion with the Council, we get it through with the line that we in the Parliament have said. And this European Parliament is clearly in favor of applying this, these rules of the single market for this pipeline as well. So I think I would not focus or demonize a German position. Germany is one of 28. The Council decides with a qualified majority. And as I said, there is no it's not a question of being afraid of Russia, certainly not. We are applying, we are standing by the sanctions that we are applying, uh, and then so far uh, I think we are on the a, on a, on a, on a right course with the other issues. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Michael. So in effect what you're saying is you expect Nord Stream 2 to be there and running, but under a different set of rules if the Parliament can have a say over it, which is the unbundling point. Are, are wider. Mm, if I may, I think that, yes, Germany is not afraid of Russia because Germany is protected by Article 5 and also Germany is protected by the presence of U.S. military bases on its territory. We are not. And we are afraid of this threat not being protected by our gas transportation system. As for the future of uh, the directive on amendments, I think it's not only Germany position. Unfortunately, this is position also of Austria, Dutch, Belgium, and Germany. And this is not enough for qualified majority. Yes, it could be a blocking minority. That's, uh, this has, <laughs> it's a double-edged sword when you start counting uh, states and weights in, in uh, voting terms. Any other question or comment quickly as I look around? Okay, I want to come with one final question to the two of you. I was listening this morning to uh, the panel chaired by Wolfgang Ischinger, and one of the points that was made there was that the US Congress is going to start turning up the heat on Europe about its energy policy. Uh, do either one of you seriously believe that the US Congress is going to decide the parameters of European energy policy? I believe that um, this, uh, firstly, uh, American uh, energy policy is already strongly affecting European, at least, gas market. And there is a very simple and very well-known example among gas traders, that prices currently lower than in other parts of the world prices which European consumers enjoy have become an outcome of competition between potential LNG supplies from US and supplies of gas from Russia. What Gazprom is currently doing because of the fear that US LNG may enter European market to larger extent than it is now, they are simply undercutting those gas supplies with their lower price. And as which, which is called competitive market dynamics, yeah? Uh, it depends on how you look at this. If you look at this, that Gazprom already is approximately roughly 40% of European um imports, that can be also perceived or considered uh, as an abuse of dominant market position. And the point which I hear from US colleagues is very simple. We would like to have fair and equal treatment. We understand that Gazprom is currently a very strong incumbent which does not allow other players to enter the market. And this is not the right thing to have. It's very simple. So their position is also very pragmatic. They're not saying buy our gas more expensive than you buy from Gazprom. They're saying let's make market rules fair and equal to all players. And Gazprom is definitely not in the position of being fair and equal. Okay. They're enjoying a dominant position and that position has not been tackled by Europe so far. Thank you, and uh, that certainly is a, 
an indisputable point. Let me turn to you, Elena, finally. You've talked about making the case. What case do you make if you're in Washington, D.C.? And who's telling you what about their response? If I may, I would better to come back to Europe because I rely, still rely on a good sense and that everything can be settled without any kind of further sanctions because it's definitely a matter of unity. And I think that Nord Stream 2 is a more threat than Salvini and its policy towards sanctions. Okay, look, ladies and gentlemen, this has been a very quick dive into the issue. Um, I fully understand the Ukrainian anxieties and I fully understand that if anyone needs to worry about Russia and what it does by way of aggression, you are Europe's and the world's leading example. Crimea, Donbass, uh, the level of aggression of weaponizing energy policy and so on. And as you said, you have a lot at stake to do with GDP. I don't know if this issue has gone its full political road. Michael Gallagher has talked about the European Parliament trying to exercise an influence to come to some of the competitive issues you mentioned. My own best guess, but let's wait and see, is that there probably will be a Nord Stream 2, but probably the pressure is going to result in some kind of a competitive dynamic that wouldn't operate otherwise. I want to thank both of you very much, uh, brief as it was, for being here and for not just the logic you bring, but as you should bring as Ukrainians, passion for your own interest. This is what your job is, and you've done your duty well today. Thank you very much indeed. Victor.